Today we're going to kind of jump off into another area of our coding. So all the intro R stuff we did is still applicable and you know pretty much everything we're doing today you can also do in what's called base R so without any additional like packages. Um, but as you might imagine, it gets pretty convoluted with square brackets and parentheses and commas and you get curly brackets in there. Um, it's hard to follow. And so we're going to look at the tidyverse as a way to really streamline data cleaning in a more readable fashion, as well as in a way that doesn't clutter up your environment. Um, you remember from before, every time we made something, you know, we'd maybe be saving a logical vector of true falses to use filtering with. And let's say you're going to do four or five different filters. Maybe you'd have four or five different logical vectors saved um, that then you're never going to use again. And so it really clutters up that environment and makes it messy uh, versus with Tidyverse, we can string everything together, um, which is kind of the end, like the, the end part of Tidyverse. Uh, first, we are going to clutter up our environment um, with every single step so we can see them. But then later, we'll string them all together with what's called pipes. And you could just do all your data cleaning technically in one function and in one step. So you just have one thing in your environment for raw and one thing in your environment for clean. We're going to be working in our studio again. And you see here, this is just nothing's open. Um, if you haven't done anything in R except for these intro R, when you automatically open, it may open in your intro R project already. That's great. Uh, so it would say intro R up here. Um, but if not, See here, I've been work. I've worked in quite a few things uh, throughout the week, so I'm going to open uh, Intro R. And if yours isn't in your, you know, recently used list, just say Open Project and uh, navigate to the folder with wherever you've changed, you know, saved all of this. We see because we're uh, working in a project. Well, that's the wrong. It's. Uh, it's opened up to where we were before. So we were working with, you know, these dat data and the metadata. It because this is a project, one of the great things, if I had just paused and closed it and was coming back, this is already open and ready and showing me last time's live notes. Um, just to like give us a clean slate, I'm gonna close that and use the sweeper to actually get rid of everything in our environment because we're gonna kind of go into a new thing with the tidyverse. And uh, do everything in a live script again. So file, new file, script. Save it um, as the 25th. And put everything in here. We're going to follow uh, the notes. So if you recall, we had our, you know, how to load data. Um, that we have just this one data object, so we can just use load and tap completion, because why not? We see dat here. Again, it has the three components, the E expression data for all of our genes and all of our samples, targets, which is our metadata, so what sample is media, what sample is infected, and then genes information on gene names and gene IDs and like things from that. So everyone should get to this point. And if you have any problems, please like ping the chat. Let me open the chat as well. Um, so if you have any problems getting the data or if this is like your first day because <laughs> uh, you didn't come on Monday, please just ping if there's any issues. So I'll leave that for a second and go to the notes because it has a nice summary about, so what, what is the tidyverse? I'm going to go to this link. So the tidyverse is a suite of packages. Uh, they package them all together into one download basically. So you can install tidyverse together, which gets your dplyr. R read R, tidy R, lots of things that end in R, as well as um, some others, string R, per, which I love, it's cat. And these packages all work really well together and can be piped together, which will show how to be connected with this, this pipe thing and get us to, from raw data all the way through plotting and statistics of the data. But we're really just gonna look at mostly data cleaning today with a little plotting at the end. The Tidyverse uh, has a th two main components, the first being your data, 
which we already have. And then these functions, which are often called verbs because they are kind of like human readable as verbs, like you select columns or variables, you filter to get different rows. So like we did before we looked at trying to get just all the media samples versus the media and TV, filter would do that. Renaming, arranging, mutating, creates a new variable. Um, grouping, so all of these verbs we're going to look at today, um, most of these ver verbs we're going to look at today, and it's really nice that this is just like a very concrete syntax of how to code in R, so, you know, we may not show how to use rename, but if you already know how to use filter, then it's really simple to be like, oh, rename works exactly the same way, the syntax is the same, only instead of saying I want media samples, I'm saying I want to rename a variable um, in some way. So this is kind of the summary of all the functions we're going to be looking at today. To start, we have to load our library our package along with our data. And so this is that note again of, you know, you've reopened a project and if you had data already loaded, the data are still here, but packages are not. So even though I'm reopening this and the last time I worked in it, I already had tidyverse loaded, I have to load uh, tidyverse again. And we see, you know, listing again, those are all the packages that it's loaded for me. So no, ma no matter whether we're in the tidyverse or not, this is how you load this R data object. Uh, but another really great feature of the tidyverse is read R, which lets you read in data. And it works exactly the same way as like read.csv or read.table from base R, but it's a bit smarter. It, automatically classifies your var variables a little bit better and it automatically uh, gives you warnings uh, when there's weird things like you're missing column names or your column names are not standard so they like have weird characters in them uh, so reading in the csv we had before instead of doing read dot table or read dot csv the tidyverse pretty consistently if a function is really similar to base R, it's the same in tidyverse but with an underscore instead of a period. So read CSV, give it our file, again tab completion, and we see as before it's gonna, if we don't save it as anything, uh, it's gonna load into and just print out in our environment, or sorry, into our console here, and we can see that it's now telling us what it's classified everything as. And so call character or character, that's the same as base R. They, those were called characters in base R as well. Uh, the difference really is how it treats numbers and true falses, which we don't have. And we see that in this lib size from before, it was where it was an integer or a numeric, um, I think it was numeric. Now it's calling it a double. Uh, a double is short for a double precise number. So it's just that it's more precise <laughs> under the hood, um, but they function the same as any numeric, but it is more exact. And the issue we were having with the exercises last week about filtering and not being able to get a column is because I was not sure why still uh, the latest version of base R basically uh, was truncating our numbers. So like all of, we looked like we had whole numbers we were trying to filter, but it's actually they had decimal places. So when we asked R, give us rows where this number is exactly equal to this other number, we were giving it like two and it needed to know 2.1, but we couldn't see the 0.1. And so the double is, kind of is nice that it's more precise to see you know if there's decimal places. Um, so like we see here, right, it's like cutting them off and there's stored, hidden stored is all the decimals. Just like base R, you have to save this as something to be able to use it as anything. So I'm gonna save it as meta and it looks, you know, it looks the same, but just so you know, read, you know, read R, read TSV, read CSV, read all of those. Uh, are a bit better to use and are great if you're already working in the tidyverse because it's, it's going to format them to work well with the rest of our functions. And this prints whenever you load something in automatically, but if you ever, you know, are you, you're way down in your workflow and you're like, oh, what was, what was that? Uh, you can specifically, you know, ask, right? You can do class just like we did before to look at 
what is this, uh, what sort of data are that um, in that column, or you can use structure if you want to get that whole whole thing again, um, as well as um, what you've seen, and then spec. So like pretty standard. These are all just ways you can kind of quickly look at what sort of data are in your um, data frame there. A little bit of review from Monday, but quite useful, <laughs> I will say, throughout your, your workflow. Uh, look at data types. So the data wrangling that we're going to do is our goal is to get a table where we can do plots looking at gene expression. So how does a gene's expression differ in a media versus a, a MTB infected sample? But you know, in our DAT data, right, we have, let me just list it here so it's easier to see. Oops. We have our expression data is in its own data frame you know, the actual human readable gene names as opposed to the IDs that I don't have memorized uh, is in genes. And then our like media versus TV designation is in targets. And so everything we're gonna do is really to take these three data frames and shove them together into one data frame, but in a way that unlike opening them in Excel and copy pasting in a way that we are 100% sure that the row from patient one is matching the row for patient one in the other data frame. And so this is, you know, one of those things where you can do it in Excel and you can do it in base R, but this is a way to do it reproducibly and in a way that you're very unlikely to have, you know, you actually can't have errors. The error would be it doesn't run. And then it's not that you're getting a table with errors, it's that your code has error. Um, and once you write it once, if you get a different RNA-seq data set, you just have to maybe change the DAT name or change the gene name and use the exact same code, uh, plus or minus one word, which is, like I said, half of what we do is Googling and copying our own or other people's code to get where we, where we need to go. So let's start with our first verb. So select. Um, you'll see also in the, the live notes for last time I added in these headers. Uh, this is a nice trick, actually, I forgot to mention. In, in an R script, uh, you can, if you use, I think it's four, yeah, if you use at least four hashtags at the end, you can create a section. Um, you don't need them at the start as well. I just think it looks nice to do that. But if you do that, then you have this little arrow and you can start minimizing. So when you have an R script that's like, you know, 400 lines long and you want to easily scroll between, you know, line 100 and line 400 because you're working in those two pieces, uh, this is a really great way to organize it. And you'll notice it in the last live notes I added in a bunch of those so it's easier. Um, so I'll periodically close this. I'll leave this open in case anyone pops in late and needs to be reminded how to load the data. So select. Uh, this is how we get columns. So if you remember in base R, we were using things like dat targets and then using the square brackets and looking at rows and columns. So that's not real code, right? That won't run. But, you know, we could do keep all the rows and then say we want, uh, you know, condition. I run that. So this is how you would, you know, get a single column in the base R version. Um, like I said, that's perfectly readable, but it can get messy when you're, you know, doing a lot. And, you know, if we did this, we'd have to save it as like dat underscore condition uh, or something. So the way to do it in tidyverse, the tidy way, is to use select. It's just like any other R function, it's the function name, parentheses, and then you give it a bunch of parameters. Uh, the first thing is the data. So we tell it that we are using the metadata. Um, I could also, I guess, use, let's just keep this actually so it matches. Um, remember, meta, the meta table and data targets are actually exactly the same data, just in two forms so that we can practice different ways to load them in. So we give it our data. Um, we don't have to say, dot data, because that's the parameter. We don't have to say this as long as data is the first thing we give it. So that's always true with our function is if you give it in the default order, you don't have to give it, you know, the flags. And so in general with tidyverse, the first thing is always your data. So I don't bother putting dot data because you don't need to. 
And then after that, we're going to list like what columns do we want. And so from our metadata, if we just look down here, like, what do we have? So we see here we have the library ID, which we definitely need because that's how we match it to the expression data. Library size, nah. Normalization factors, nope, don't need that. Uh, full ID, eh, maybe, maybe we won't need. Maybe we want to color by individual so that's each person's ID. Um, RSID is another ID for a person. But really, we, you know, we want the library and the condition. And so we just list those. We want the library. And let's also keep full ID just in case. And by in case, I mean I know I'm going to use it. And condition. And so this is the same if we make this the same. Just as doing this. And so we see we're already able to make it a little bit shorter than base R and that tidyverse when you're using variable names doesn't require you to put them in quotations. Um, as well as you don't have to concatenate them into a, a, a vector like you do here. And so you see if we run that um, and again as a reminder command or control enter will run your code or you can if you prefer to use your mouse and use the button it's up here. And we see it's just selected the three columns that we want. Again, prints this out, so we actually want to save this. Uh, you will notice the naming is gets very long. Uh, we'll fix that later with those pipes that I keep alluding to. But here we're just going to give it a sub for subset, because um, that is my habit to end things with sub or filter, depending on what I've done to it. And now we see, still have all our rows, but now we only have three variables. So this is one way to do it. You can list every single column you want. We have a very small data frame that totally works, uh, but you can also shorten this. So we could also instead say, so we know from the original, so if we go back to the original data frame, we maybe want, say you want all three of these columns, you could type out full ID number, RSID and condition, or you can do a little cheat not a cheat, a shorthand. So we want the lib ID and then full ID colon condition will get us everything in between. And if we look at that, so just selecting that one word and looking at it. So if you know you need column, you know, one and then 10 through 20, like you can just put the 10th name and the 20th name and the colon says list everything in between. So let's get all columns. And the final way to kind of use select is to remove columns instead of selecting what you need. So another way to do ex exactly what we've done starting exactly the same as select meta. Now, instead of saying what I want, I'm going to say what I don't want with the minus sign, say remove library size and remove uh, norm factors with the O, I think. It does the same thing. So these all do the same thing. They're just an example of ways to do it. And it just depends on what you're goal is if you have a giant data frame and you're pulling out three columns it's easiest just to like list the three you need if you have a giant one and really you're just trying to remove two it's easiest to list the two that you're gonna um, remove and then knowing if you know your data really well and know that you want between that's another way to to keep it short the other thing you'll note here is our variable names right so let's just look at the original meta um, just like file names on a computer, uh, R doesn't love spaces. So you see here, like we have periods in between things that are kind of two words uh, so that we can just simply put them. Um, if you had variables that have special characters, so anything other than letters, numbers, underscore, period, um, or hyphen, or if they like start with period or something, then you have to add more text basically so odd column names 
we're just gonna select this. We don't need this here, but it's it's how you do it is you use the tick marks. Uh, so if you have basically any column name that's not couldn't be seen as one single word, you put the tick marks around it and then that forces uh, R in the tidyverse to know, oh, this is the column name. Similar to using the double quotations here, but just a tidyverse specific thing. So in my experience, it's always good to just name your variables such that you don't have to bother with that extra keystroke all the time. And as always, stop, jump in, put something in the chat if there's questions. So that's how we get columns. How do we get rows? So filtering is for rows. Um, in your, you know, casual vernacular, I guess, filtering works really well, right? Often when we, when I was talking about doing this in VASAR, I was saying filter. So that's kind of the, the logical function name, select. It may be not, I had to kind of teach myself to use that as the verb, uh, but it's really easy that you just remember what filter does and then you know select is the other one if you're having problems remembering which is where the filter is to filter like how we would already normally say it so again as a comparison to base arm you know before we were doing meta and again the rows columns things this isn't code uh, the rows columns and so now we're you know if we keep all of our columns and instead we were doing something like meta um, condition equals media to get all of the media samples now here's where tidyverse just already becomes ridiculously more easily read so to do this in the tidyverse Sure, I named this okay. two. So we're naming just gets like, what does two mean? In the end, it won't matter because we're not going to use it. Uh, we filter. We give it our data that we're going to. We always start with with the data we want to use. And now instead of having to write, you know, re-reference. So in R, this is telling this the data frame, and then it's telling it the data frame again because that's where it needs to pull out the vector of conditions to make the decision. Now I don't have to do any of that. I just say condition. Uh, and actually, let's just not save this. Let's just look at it. And it does the same thing. And so it's not really any shorter yet, but it's much more easily read. Like I'm filtering meta to get condition equal to media versus I'm filtering meta where meta is condition. It just gets a bit longer. Uh, and when you start doing multiple, like, you know, start adding and and or and multiple things, it's just much easier to read. So that's not basic. So we don't actually want, I decided not to save that because that's not actually like our goal isn't to only look at media samples. That was just an example to see how to use filter initially. What we actually want to do is filter our um, expression data. We're going to get interferon gamma as the gene, as like our poster child gene. So the first thing is we got to get our expression data. Um, I'm going to call it counts and it's dat. E, right, is that's what the counts data. This is, you know, I could just start with this, but again, this is just to show, right, this is a giant data frame counts. We see each column is a sample, media or TB from the RSID being that individual. And an important note for those who are actually going to work with RNA seq data from our group that this is already a data frame because I'm the one who formatted it. Uh, often it won't be, often it'll be a matrix, uh, which Tidyverse does not work with. And so it just, this isn't necessary for these data, but it is something I just always do just in case. It takes me just as long to type as data frame that, than it does to check the class of the data frame and then decide if I'm gonna type. Uh, so this just forces if it's a matrix, which again, those like when you view them, how you would see them in Excel, they look exactly the same, but like under the hood for R, they're, they're different. Um, so this doesn't change anything 
but if it were a matrix, that's how you would force it. And it'll, you know, depending on who made the raw data, it might still be a matrix because uh, that's how the default program for our data cleaning outputs it. Um, and I'm just always the one who works in Tidyverse who forces it into a data frame immediately. So let's look at counts. So I mostly saved it as counts so we could look at it easily. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that this row names, so it's grayed out, meaning this isn't data in the data frame, it's separate row names, just like column names are separate, they're not in the data frame, um, which is fine. Uh, but for what we're going to do, right, we're going to want to filter to a specific ID for interferon gamma. And so in the tidyverse, I can't filter based on row names. In fact, if you load data directly into the tidyverse, uh, not as an R data object, but like as a table that has row names, tidyverse yells at you. Uh, or it doesn't yell at you, it scolds you and it's like, you have row names, maybe you shouldn't. Uh, that's just a philosophy of the writers of the packages. They believe that um, no data should be hidden, which row names technically are, they should all be part of the data frame. I don't feel strongly either way. The program that makes the RNA-seq outputs gives it row names. So here's how we deal with that. So counts row name is another tidyverse function, which I never have to type out all the way because it's long, is very logical phrase there, row names to column. I'm gonna take the row names and put them into a data column so that I can filter by them. Nope, counts. And so we see here one more variable and it's just shoved our row names and it if you don't tell it anything it automatically names it row name uh, if you don't like that we can certainly oops you can rename it as well just by adding a parameter um, so like uh, what did I call it I forget what I call it. So we're just going to call it something. So now it's named gene name. Um, and that's nice with you just, you know, instead of having to move it and then rename it with another function rename, you can just do it uh, all at once. Uh, we're going to use row name for now. So I'm going to comment that out and just use this one. So now we have these data, and so we want interferon gamma, right? And so we want interferon gamma counts autocomplete. See how I actually I often type the data first and then type the function because I forgot. So as a pop quiz, no, as a question, does anyone think that uh, this may or may not work? Can marinate it on, on it. So if you run this, uh, let's look at the data frame. We see zero rows. And so this is the first thing about the RNA-seq data and how they're formatted that it seems like, like why would we do this? Um, like why would we not just use the, you know, the human, oops, sorry, the human readable name that like biologists would recognize? Why do we use these codes? So that's why it doesn't work because our row names aren't these are called HGNC signal or symbols or Hugo symbols. That's not what's in here. And uh, for those again who are going to work with RNA-seq data, this is just a reality of working with gene data that there are multiple names, there are multiple IDs even. There's ensemble, there's entree, there's Hugo. There's all these different ways to designate what a gene is uh, and they're not 100% the same. So there are some genes that exist in some databases that don't exist in the other ones, 
or that have a you know overlapping name. So there are like ensemble IDs, which are these that end up having two Hugo names, which those are the more human readable ones, or vice versa. There's two Hugo names that actually only have one ensemble ID. Um, so we like to use these IDs because they're specific to not just the gene name, but the location, what chromosome it's on and what base pair, um, which is why in our counts data, these are here. Even though in the end, we're always going to be filtering and plotting and looking for the Hugo name that we recognize, this is more accurate and will prevent errors in the future of, oh, I, you don't have that gene in your data. Oh, no, you do. It's just the older Hugo name or a different name versus these IDs are always accurate. They stay like, they stay the same. They will add more IDs when more genes are identified, but they do not get rid of old IDs. So, right, this doesn't work because we don't have this in there, but we can go get it, right? Our dat genes. Oops. Okay. That's not super readable, but where's the top? If you just want to see the top of data, head. there we go. Much more easily read. So, we, that's why this data frame is packaged together with all the other data frames in these data. It's because we like to use this ID. We need to use this ID to be specific, but in the end, we're going to use this symbol as what we actually like recognize. And so like I can verify that by asking like, is interferon gamma in that genes, H genes symbol? So this is, I'm not putting it in the notes because right, this isn't data we're saving. Um, this is another way to use those true false, you know, or these not to get a true false answer. Is this in this whole column? Um, you could put multiple things like is A and B in this column and it'll tell you. So we can't just filter. We have to learn more functions. So the two ways to think about doing this is you can, right, you could just say, okay, I'm going to, you know, find the ID for interferon gamma. So I could just say filter dat genes where HGNC symbol equals Sorry, I could run that and I could copy paste this. So instead of doing this, I can now copy this, put this in there. I'm not going to save this just so we can look at it. And now we see we actually get a row of data and that's perfectly fine. That works. Um, but then every single time I want to change my gene, I have to, you know, I have to run this. I have to change this text. I have to run it. I have to look what it outputs. I have to copy what it outputs and put it in this spot. And so it's not particularly reproducible and it requires that I be here and do something in between these two steps, as opposed to just running my script and having it, having me say, I want interferon gamma, you figure out what the ID is for me. I don't want to have to copy paste it. And so we can instead take our two data frames and join them, switch them together so that now we can, it'll just do it for us. So that's kind of like the so that's the, the novice way. Now we're going to do like an intermediate way by joining the tables. Ooh, use the correct data frames, technically. Ah, uh, for the error in the chat, chat. So I, if you ran this one last, now it's named gene name. So rerun this so that it's actually called row name or change this to say gene name. Otherwise it can't find it. Cool. Okay, so joining. The way tidyverse joins works, and I'm not going to show this in base R because there's not really a, an equivalent way to do it in base R that's not like difficult and really hard to read and actually I would have had to look up how to do it because it's been I would never try to do it in base R ever because uh, errors so the way the joins work is there's many types of join uh, so 
so this isn't code, but they're something underscore join and it's data frame. Then you give it data frame one. Data frame two and then by column name to match, which obviously this is a code, right? But this is how the joins work is you give it two data frames and then tell it match my rows from the two by this column name. And you can give it multiple column names to match by, or you can let it find its column names as well. And there are multiple joins um, in the notes. You'll see there's a link to, I just find this incredibly helpful <laughs> document um, from an undergraduate class long ago, still up here that you know, there's inner joins and outer joins and left joins, and we'll, we'll do a couple of them, but it's really good to think about you know, the different types of join, like inner means it has to be in both of the data frames, right? So like you have your two data frames here, and we see that you know DC only exists in the publishers, so it doesn't end up in the final data frame, you know, or it does, sorry, it's over here. So like <laughs> wrong row. Like DC exists in both, so it ends up in there. Dark Horse doesn't exist in both, so it, it, it gets removed, it gets lost. Uh, semi, you know, there's lots of different ones. Um, so it's just thinking about which do you want the left first data frame? Do you want every row in that to still exist? Do you want every row in the second one? Um, or my favorite, full join, which just keeps every row from everything. Um, very often I run full join first and then look at NAs, look at missing and just to, to decide, oh, and to find errors to like be like, okay, there shouldn't be this many missing. They should match better what happened. Uh, and usually typo in a variable name is the answer to that question. So we're going to do an inner join, which is keep rows in both data frames. Genes counts because we're combining those two things. Inner join. Let's see, counts with row names moved, and then our dat genes. So we can give it by, but first show you that if you just run it, right, it's gonna it's gonna automatically try to find by for you. So it's saying you know by must be supplied. So you have to tell it what column. Um, or it will try to find it. But right, if we look here, so like our column names of counts row name and our column names of dat genes, it can't find any to match by because none are named the same. So this won't work. This is, this is an error because it can't find a column to match by. And since, you know, we could go through the effort of making, of taking, you know, this data frame and renaming a column, so then it matches a column name in dat genes, but we don't have to. We can instead just give it the by and say by, and these are listed in the order they are. So what is the column name in this? It is called row name equals what is the column name in this one? And that is gene name. So now it's gonna match those two. And we can see now on the left is all of the expression data matched on the right to all of the additional really what we care about is this column, the HGC symbol that we recognize. And we, unlike copy pasting in, in Excel, we're 100% sure that the this ensemble ID has been matched perfectly in both. And because we used inner join, if there was a gene in our expression that wasn't in our you know gene key, it would be removed. That doesn't occur in these data, um, which we can see from the fact that you know, the you can look at the number of genes, right? So like the dimensions of DAT are 14,500 something genes, right? And the dimensions of genes counts is the same 
So that's a good way to check looking at the DIM for dimensions of, we know we did inner, meaning we could have lost rows, but we didn't because every gene is in both. So in this case, full join, inner join, semi join, all the joins actually would give you the same answer. Just as an example, I'm actually gonna take this and show you. And again, I will add more words to these. Uh, if we had done this, right? If we had already named, just copy pasting, see, I already just copy paste your own code. If we had named it gene name because we knew in the future we were gonna be joining it with that genes and we knew that was the name. And then we did this, we see that it runs and it tells us hey, you didn't tell me what to join by, so this is the column name that I found that I think matches. This is what I've joined by. Uh, and if that's were incorrect, you know that you'd need to give it by and say a different column name. And this gets us the same output. So like dim genes, it's, it's the same. So now, unlike before where we had to copy paste or what have you, we now have the, in gene counts, we now have every single symbol name that we could possibly want attached correctly. So now we can do interferon gamma is in genes, counts, filter, <laughs> bad habit. And now I can say that I know that HGNC symbol equals interferon gamma. And we see one, one row here. And so it seems like a tiny thing, right? But now if I wanna change my code, I just have to change one thing as opposed to changing one thing, running it, copying, pasting, and running the next thing. And so if I had this in a reproducible script that I was just saying, hey, start script, run from start to end, it could do that without me having to pause in the middle and copy paste an ID and do it. So in terms of getting everything we need to plot interferon gamma gene expression, like we're almost there, right? We have the gene, we have the specific gene, even though the you know ID, I don't have to memorize. And then we have all of our different libraries. Um, they're labeled as Meteor TV, but right, that's not a variable we can combine by. So now we want to add in our sample metal data. And what we're going to have to do is pivot. And the reason is because if we look at, right, if we look at head of top, again, head is just the first couple rows. Genes counts. Got to remember the names. Um, and then head of our metadata. You know, we see that this is what we need to match by, right? Like our library ID is the same as these column names here. But as is, there's no way to tell R to do a join like we did before based on column names and then data in a single column. Like those can't, they don't go together. It has to be in its own column to match its own column and another one. And so to do that, we pivot the tables, which is just looking at long versus wide data. So wide data um, or something like you just think about physically think about like what the data frame would look like if you like drew a box around it. And it's generally the most wide data means one column per variable, one um, row per sample, which is what our metadata almost are. <laughs> most data aren't 100% wide or 100% long, they're usually in between. And long means one column for the values of all variables, many rows for each sample. And so ours tend to be, these tend to be wide formats, right? We have a single gene that has its own row in this, and we have you know, a single library, a sequencing library or a sample, another way to think about it that has its own row. 
but we need to do right is take these column names whoops, these column names and shove them into their own row thus making the data longer because we're going to take instead of having every column has its own library now we're going to have a column that tells us which library it came from and a single column that has all of the data and i'll say saying this out loud and like reading about it is like is really hard uh i still generally like when i'm going to do one of these pivots i like do the pivot and then i look at the data like an output like i save the data and i look at it uh because sometimes it gets a little confusing where things went and to make sure it does exactly what you actually want it to do uh is very important. So, right, this is the note head of interfering gamma, right? We have each sample has its own column, and now we're going to pivot it. So, interfering gamma long version is pivot longer, make it longer, and then tell it where your data are. So, if you don't tell it anything else, it's going to try to pivot all of the columns uh, but we don't want that right we want we still want gene name to be in its, its own column we don't want it to shove gene name into the column with all these other data we want it to you know have a column that's gene name and a column that's what library it came from and a column that's the values that it came from and so similar to select you can list every column you want it to use you can list minus the columns you don't want it to use um, which is what I'm going to do because that's the shortest way. So I can say minus A, minus B, minus C, or I can just say minus and then this concatenate into it, the vector, all the things. So I don't want it to pivot um, my gene names. I don't want it to pivot my HGMD. Because remember all the way at the end here, we have all these other things we don't want it to pivot. So again, everything in between. I could type out all four of these things or I could just use the semicolon. So these are everything I don't want it to touch as opposed to listing out that I want it to touch this through this, which you can also do, which I'll show in a second. And then you tell it where you want the names to go actually. Let's just let it do it default for a second. And we're not gonna save it, we're just gonna look at it. So what happens when you do that? We see that any column that we said minus don't touch is still there. So the gene name is still here. And then all of our data on genes are still there. But now everything that we didn't say don't touch, the column name gets put into a name column and the value gets put into a value column. And these are the automatic names that it uses. But we can also just keep adding parameters, names to, we know that these are, library IDs and then values to they are interferon gamma um, but we could just call them expression we could call them whatever so now it's exactly the same thing only it's just labeled these what we already know the other data frame labeled them and I didn't save this wide to long and then just to show you you can undo this if we take pivot wider uh, you know be glad you missed the years of spread and gather in the old version names which were confusing we're going to take interview and gamma long names Instead of saying names to, we're not putting them somewhere, we're taking them from somewhere. So it's names from libid, oops. Values again from where the values from. And I never said I never ran that, so that didn't exist yet. Uh, and now it's back. So I just it looks I know I last time I did identical, it didn't work, but Actually, I didn't say that. No, we'll just don't do that. <laughs> uh, long and then back to wide. 
not normally you wouldn't you know immediately undo what you just did that's why i'm not saving this we only really want the long format and so this gets really helpful with plotting and with merging data that are in different forms or that have data you know everything in a column versus in its in its individual row and like i said it's it's probably the most difficult tidyverse thing to wrap your head around and so i strongly recommend if you ever need to pivot is don't just throw this step in and move on like look like look at what it did uh, and double check that you know interferon gamma and long you know that this did what i thought it did do i have all of the columns i said don't touch and you know do these library ids are there any in there that i'm like that's not a library id that's not what i thought you should be But now, right now we have wrong one. Now we have a library ID column from originally from our meta. That's how it already was to match to I open the right data frame to match to a library ID column. So Now we can join these just like we joined before. And I've tried to make these data frame names actually helpful, but you see it already gets a bit messy trying to remember what is what, and that's that's just the nature. <laughs> so we're going to interjoin again. If we don't have expression data or we don't have metadata, we don't want to keep it. Of interference gamma long and meta our subset metadata um, because we don't want our subset. Remember, we just removed some columns that we didn't care about. Right now we have everything that we need. We could clean this up a bit more. So this is kind of an optional we could just move forward with this, uh, but I think to get it to print nicely in the uh, R Markdown document notes, we can now say, okay, interfering gamma, meta, and now we're going to subset it again and select interfering gamma, meta. And what we actually really need to look at expression in media versus TV is just our library ID because that's unique for every sample. What our interfering gamma expression was and our condition. Um, and actually, we're going to also just again keep full ID just so I can show some pretty colors. Now we just have some of those original columns. So that's all the cleaning we need to do in order to actually make a plot. Uh, but you'll see here, right, if we list everything in our environment, we have, you know, the things that we actually needed, right, DAT, the original DAT data, the original metadata, great. But in the end, we don't, we don't need the, you know, any of the other intermediate files that we had to make along the way. And like I said, I tried to give them names that were helpful, but even with that, like I know, I know a month from now, if I read these, I'd be like, um, what is that again? <laughs> So, you know, and it just clearly like it's R is storing these. Uh, if you have the latest version of R Studio, I like just upgraded. I'm super excited. Like it shows you how much RAM it's using, and like these data frames aren't huge, uh, but they uh, could be. Uh, the full data of some RNA seq experiments is gigabytes large, and so if you have you know the, almost the same data frame, so you have counts and counts row names, which are just one column different it has to be storing both of them in its memory. And then you're like, your usage up here can get to be huge and it's gonna slow down R, it's gonna slow down your machine. It could even crash your machine if you don't have enough RAM to be doing all of that. So enter pipes, the most like amazing thing about the tidyverse, I think at least. So just looking at the notes real quick, cause there's some not code that's helpful. So, the way a pipe works is that instead, so don't read this text yet, just don't read the text. 
uh, so the way a pipe works is that it's going to take whatever the output of function one is and pipe it, put it into function two. So instead of having to save, you know, output one and then run the next line, output two, and then run the next line, and you've saved output one, two, three, and in our case, like seven different data frames. Now instead, it's not going to save it to your environment. It's just it's going to know, okay, I, I made this output. I'm never going to I'm never going to show it to you. I just I know I made it, and then it's going to immediately use it in the next. And so this means that you can do everything we've done and only start with one data frame and end with one output data frame um, after everything. And so for those with, uh, I guess, who like math uh, phrasing, just a way to think about it is you have function, uh, you know, function f that works on x, you pipe it into function g that works on y, and y is the output of this first one, which if you nest it looks like this. For those who don't like the math uh, and want to actually see words, fair. Uh, similar to this, that you know, this is only one function, but we can use a pipe. We can say select our metadata um, and select the libid column, or I can say take meta, pipe it into select and give me libid. And so this is saying, you know, basically it's whatever's before the pipe is getting copy pasted as the first as the first argument, so nothing, you know, nothing is here, but it's getting copy pasted as that first argument. So what does this actually mean in practice? Like how is this actually going to help us? And again, similar to pivoting, it's one of those just talking about it is great intro, but until you run it, it's not the easiest thing to visualize. My notes, so I call things the same things as in the notes. Uh, with the way these data are, sadly, uh, it, it's better to do two steps. So we're going to, just to show you that this works, we're going to delete everything out of my environment. We're going to go back and copy this. Oops, don't need to do that again. So we're going to start fresh. Pretend like we the last hour didn't happen. Uh, how are we going to clean these data and use pipes? So we know that the majority of our data cleaning is happening with E expression data and genes, the gene information, uh, and that really we only did one thing to Meta, right? We only just selected some columns from Meta, and arguably we don't even really need to do that, but just in case. So this can't be piped in. Or correction, this is harder to read if you pipe in. So first. We're just, we are going to, but we're still going to use the pipe to show how it works. Wait, we're going to take metadata and we're going to pipe it. Um, let's see, I always have to just think about it. Command Shift M or Control Shift M is how you type a pipe. So Command, command Shift M or Control for Windows uh, is how you shortcut to a pipe, but that's what a pipe looks like. Uh, the latest version of R, also uh, the new pipe, is slightly shorter. I think it's this. <laughs> don't quote me on that. I don't have the newest, so I can't use it. Uh, but if you do Command Shift M and it shows up looking different than this, that is still correct. It's just the newer version of the pipe uh, because if you don't use that shortcut, it is very annoying to type this out, so they have made it shorter. But anyway, the pipe. We're going to do is then take our metadata and put it into our select function, which is the same select function we did before. We just want our lib ID, our full ID number, for colors, and our condition. And that, so here's our subset metadata. And now we can, you know, that's not really any shorter, right? It's just to show you can do a single function that way. Uh, this is why whenever I was typing, I typed the data frame name first without typing the function name because I use pipes for literally everything. So I'm not used to typing select meta. I'm used to meta pipe select, just as a aside of why, why I did that. And now instead of having our millions of data frames, we're just going to already know we're going to make our interferon gamma data frame. So. And this is copy pasting 
well, I'm typing it, but it's copy pasting from everything we've done, uh, just typing it out fresh to be able to go through it. So we're going to take our expression data. Remember, the first thing is we had to move the row names into a column. So we're going to pipe it into row names to column. Uh, we could leave this as row name, but remember we needed to rename it. So might as well do that now. We already know that the column we're going to join it with is gene name. So might as well do that now. And now instead of saving this, we just pipe again and join it to that genes. Uh, because we've named this gene name, we don't need to give it by, it will automatically do that. And then we pipe and we filter, we want our HGNC symbol equal to, and again, you're gonna, you can copy paste that from the notes uh, as well. Then we're going gamma, and then we wanna merge it with metadata, so we have to pivot it. So we pivot longer, everything except, what was it, gene, name, names again giving it names so that it automatically will join correctly to lib id values to uh, bring gamma now yeah, we pipe <laughs> uh, so you know i wouldn't recommend typing all this out the first time and trying to run it you know run each line as you write it but we already know these lines should run because we ran them before so we're going to inner join to our metadata. Again, we've automatically named it and select. And I see the questions there. I will. Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we only need lib ID, interfering gamma, full ID number. So again, if I were actually like just de novo doing this, I would run this line you know these two lines make sure it works look at my output did that do what i want and then i would add this line and run it um, see okay it joined by gene name that's correct good good so you check each as you go um, until you get really familiar with the tidyverse then maybe you could type two or three before checking but even i don't really go beyond that because it just breaks um, and so i can have your cursor anywhere because this is all one function it's just a long several lines uh, that's also, I like, I like things being skinny. Uh, we run, we tell us, you know, it tells us we have two joins where we didn't tell it what to join by. So it's going to give us a message of what it joined by. And so now we see our really very much simpler environment. We just have our original data. We had to subset one separately and then, you know, everything. Already done and our environment's beautiful. And if we wanted to look at another gene, right, we would just have to change this. And, you know, I, we should probably change this name um, as well, not call it the wrong thing, but, you know, I can just change this to whatever other gene I want. Which I'm not going to run because I'm going to probably pick a gene that doesn't actually exist in this data. So that's some of the tidyverse functions we didn't show rename we didn't show a couple of them um but that tidyverse web page has a great help page that lists all the functions and kind of like what they do like select select columns uh so once you know this syntax it's really easy to keep adding on uh, and it's really great because what we'll do after we take a quick break is then look how it plays with ggplot which is the tidyverse's uh, chosen plotting um, as well as what we won't have time to see but i'll include links to uh, i think there's already links to in the notes is Tidyverse and tidy data is a really popular thing. And so there's like tidy models for running pretty complex linear uh, modeling things. There's like, like I said, there's like GG, GG tree, which is making phylogenetic trees in the ggplot world. There's ggven, making Venn diagrams in the ggplot world. Um, so there's dozens, if not more than that, I don't want to say a hundred, but maybe uh, 
at least dozens of packages that aren't in tidyverse but that play nice with tidyverse um, and i will say once you get used to coding in tidyverse um, if you choose to continue doing it you can certainly i know i know programmers who still choose to work in base r and are very effective but if you choose to then it's kind of nice that if you see a package and say i want to make x if there's already a tidy approved package it's probably going to be easier for you to learn a new package because it's going to have the same syntax and it's going to follow these same rules and it's going to work nicely with pipes uh which just says this is in the notes but uh someone had asked me about it earlier like when i mean pipes like i could pipe this into a linear model looking at uh how does ooh, should type this correctly how does uh, interferon gamma expression differ so between those two, um, LM is not a tidy function, so you have to like force it to take the data as a period where it's going to pipe it in. All right, it's going to run my linear model for me. So there are modeling functions that are tidy as well as they're there. It's, it's worth checking if you have something that is going to like end this. So just see if you can pipe into it. I do that a lot where I just like, can I pipe into this? And if it doesn't run, oh, well, <laughs> then I have to save it as an object and then run the next step separately. Um, so before I take a little break, are there any questions or errors of code not running? And I know this is a lot and it will take practice and looking at it again. But any other thoughts at this moment? Okay, we're going to take uh, five minutes then. Let's come back about 4.15. Stretch, get water, don't melt. So, uh, like I said, we've gone over some tidyverse verbs, not all of them, but enough to like, get you started. And like I said, once the syntax becomes like normal to you, it's really easy to plug in the other ones. Uh, so now we're going to look at plotting. Um, and this, I will say, even if you don't choose to use the tidyverse like pipes and data cleaning and select and things like that, I would strongly recommend ggplot. Uh, even like outside of the tidyverse, you can just load ggplot too as its own package. Uh, simply just because it, it makes, uh, for I found at least, in making plots as close to publication quality as you can uh, in R, I found is the easiest to do with ggplot. Trying to get a base R graphics to look beautiful uh, it takes a lot more effort um, with the caveat, though, that it always seems there's always one tiny little thing uh, that maybe you find that, oh, gosh, like, uh, just can I load this in Illustrator and do this? And the answer is yes, we all still do that. Um, but ggplot gets you anywhere from, you know, 90 to 99 percent of the way to your like your publication ready. You're perfect. Exactly what you want it to be plot. Uh, and you will find if you start using it that over the years, you know, you, your level of what you're willing to do uh, increases as you learn things. So like I finally bit the bullet and learned how to put uh, Greek symbols into my variable names in ggplot. And now that I've learned it, now it's not a problem. And now it's not something I need to go to Illustrator for. But I did do that in Illustrator for many years because it was annoying in R. Um, but starting out, it gets you a lot of the way there. And if you need to perfect elsewhere, don't feel bad. I love R and I still do that. Um, so why does ggplot get you most of the way there? So it's based on this idea of called ggplot is the grammar of graphics. And so it's this idea that similar to with the tidyverse and you pipe together all these things, ggplot works with a plus sign and you add together different parts of the plot. You tell it your data and then you tell it, you know, what theme do you want to use for like the basic colors and lines? Do you want to add points? That's one layer. Do you want to add lines? That's another layer. And you can add them together similar to these pipes where you end up with, you know, something that's technically one function and it maybe is 10, 15 lines long to get your like exactly perfect, beautiful plot that you wanted. Uh, but similar to pipes, it, technically one, it runs all as one, you're not saving intermediate objects, you're not cluttering stuff up, and it's really easy to customize, you know, one plot you've made for something into a similar but slightly different plot for something else. And so 
in the notes again. Uh, the main building blocks are listed here of what you need or can use in ggplot. So you, you need, you have to have data. So a data, data frame. It is built to work with tidyverse. So data frame, not matrix. Again, looks very similar, but slightly different. There's what's called aesthetics. So those are things that are in your data frame. If you want to tell it to color things by condition, our media TV, that's an aesthetic because condition is in our data. If we wanted to just color it red, red is not in our data frame. It's not any variable. So then that's just a, a color. It doesn't need to be an aesthetic, um, which that's important and where you put it in the function. And we'll, we'll see what happens when you put it in the wrong spot. What are called geomes, uh, so geome point for a dot plot, geome bar for a bar plot. Uh, I don't think there's geome then, but there's some other weird geomes of what, how do you want to be plotting these data? And so really these are the three things you absolutely have to have. You have to have data, you have to have variables from those data that you're going to plot, and then you have to tell it like basic, do you want a pie chart? Do you want a dot plot? What do you want? Uh, additional things you can use, but don't have to, you can run statistics, you can transform the data, you can fit linear lines, you can do more complex fitting of lines, uh, scales, maybe you want to put it on things like log scale, facets, which I'll show are really cool. It lets you go from, you know, having to copy paste your code, code 10 times to make 10 plots. And instead you add one line of code and it makes all 10 plots for you automatically. And it, I can't say enough positive about facets. It makes you feel like you've done a million things, but you've only added one line of code. It's great. Uh, and then guides, you know, small aesthetic things. You want to change the axes and the labels and the legend. Um, I will say another huge positive of ggplot over base R is it automatically makes the legend for you. Uh, so you know the legend is correct. Uh, I remember struggling in base R with making my legend basically by hand, and then being really, really terrified that I had accidentally made what I thought the blue group was A, it was actually B, and everything in the plot's wrong, and my data are, you know, just horribly flawed, and, you know, I always say I never had a horrible experience where that happened, and then it was like in a publication or something, but it was the stress level of just knowing your, if your legend is, you know, wrong, it's because you what you want isn't in there not because it doesn't match the data it is 100 percent. it matches the data that's how it works it's automatic and if you want to change it you can do that so our goal is to create a box plot looking at media versus tb infected expression of interferon gamma as well as technically any other gene so to do that we're going to start with just the minimum number of pieces of what we need so ggplot always starts with the function ggplot. Uh, you give it your data. So we're going to use our interfering gamma data. And then we give it, again, the required, so AES for aesthetics. Anything that is a variable in interfering gamma has to go inside of this aesthetics parameter. That is the number one error when learning ggplot is putting something that is a variable not in here or putting something like color equals red in here, in which case that's not, that's not a thing in the data. So it can't find it in the data because it doesn't exist. So we tell X, you know, what is our X variable? It's condition. What is our Y variable? It's interfering gamma. So we have two of the pieces. And so if I just run this, I'll show you if you run it, it actually does run and it shows it scales and this, it, shows you the outline of what your plot is going to be, uh, but you haven't told it how you want the, the data visualized. You haven't told it, do I want a box plot? Do I want a dot plot, et cetera. Uh, but this will run, and if you're you know curious, kind of the outline, of like how is this gonna go? This is, you just run this first and look at it. Um, but like I said, these are building blocks. So instead of a pipe, which again, common typo for all of us is using a pipe is in plus and mixing these up, but ggplot is pluses just plus sign, go on to another line. You don't have to go on to another line, but it's easier to read. And I'm going to tell it I want a geom box plot. I'm not going to give it any other parameters. So this is the minimum. Data, at least one aesthetic. We need two in this case because we have x and y and then a box plot. And so we have a box plot pops up here.
And so that, if that doesn't, um, if you've worked with a base R, I would argue that this is much prettier than the base R version. But, you know, it's not, it's not amazing yet, right? So we're just going to keep adding on to this. And so what you're going to see is here, I'm not going to copy paste because it's not necessary, but it is separate in the notes, each piece. We're just going to keep using pluses and adding on to this plot to make it what we want. So something that's really nice when you have a box plot is these are, you know, the median and the quartiles, but it's actually nice to see the spread of the data, like how many samples are actually in each group? Is it, you know, this is the median, but it's, are things, you know, clustered closer around there and, you know, differences. So we can just add that now, instead of making a new plot with dots, we just add plots, points to this plot, the geome point. And we see along the same, the middle line, it has now added, you know, what, 10 points per group, because that's how many we have. This is easily readable, right? Because there's only 10. Uh, oftentimes, it's not so readable. Uh, so actually, I just said this, I wasn't going to do this, but we're actually going to change the function. So I do need to copy paste it. Um, so this is readable. This works. This works great. Uh, if you have a ton of points, sometimes you can't see them like this. They all overlap and it becomes just a black bar. Uh, so instead, you can use geo jitter. And we can say how much we want to jitter. So basically fudge the data by so we can see things. Um, and I like to, this is a personal choice. I always like to, you know, if my Y axis is my data, then I like to make that the height, the Y not change. I don't want it to be, you know, I mean, visually you really couldn't tell because visually this is a plot. I'm not trying to like draw a line exactly over to the Y axis and estimate the number. But I always, for me, it's a preference of, I like to make sure that whatever my numeric variable is, I don't jitter on. So make that zero. And then width, and importantly, width isn't, you know, this is a group, right? The width isn't a value. Like if this was one and two, that, that doesn't equate to that. It's the proportion of the box plot. So we can see that here if we say 0.2, sorry, a proportion of the plot, like 0.5, now we can see that everything actually goes across half the plot. So they kind of, you know, um, it's a, I will say it's starting at point two, it's I very rarely deviate from, from point two. And you'll see every time I run this, it looks slightly different. Um, that's because this has to do with a random seed uh, and we didn't set a seed in this. Uh, actually, I think even if you set a seed, it'll do this. So importantly, the left right is changing because it's random because I've set height to zero, the, the data are being represented correctly every time. Uh, and so in the end, I tend to not care about this, you can set the seed and force the jitter to be identical every single time. Personally, I've found that it, it matters. Uh, and if you for some reason you would you saw back there first, there was one like, I don't like this one. I don't like, I was like, I don't like this jitter. Like these kind of are in a weird arc in a row. It doesn't really look truly random. You know, you just run it again and get a new jitter and say, oh, okay, I like this one. This one works fine. Uh, so one important thing also note about box plots is it doesn't happen here because we don't have any outliers, uh, but the box plot geome automatically puts dots for outliers. So like the way outliers work is they don't um, contribute to the box because they're an outlier. So they get their own point. There aren't any here. Uh, but importantly, if there were, there would be two points. So for example, if this point were an outlier, there would be a point from the geome box plot and there'd be a point from my geome jitter. And so the way to get around that is to just tell it, uh, you can set any of these. So right, you can say you can make your outlier size zero, then it won't be there. You can make, you know, the, the color the same as your background, you do lots of things. Uh, my go to is to say that the shape is nothing <laughs> is NA. Uh, like I said, a lot, there's, you'll see lots of ways in code. I did this, I copy paste my code a lot. So this is kind of how I do it. And so we see it doesn't change anything. But if there were an outlier, it's very important to not show the point twice. And from that, we can just can continue to beautify it. Uh, maybe I don't like these labels, they're not specific enough. So I can start adding those uh, scales and things. So labs for labels. 
I want some very specific labels. So I know it's interferon gamma normalized log two expression. That's what these data are. Uh, and X, maybe I don't, yeah, it already says median TV. So I don't really need it to tell me that it's conditioned. So I can just make X blank. Uh, there's other ways to make X blank, but this is just one way to do it. So we see now nicer label, can also make this bigger. Nicer label going on here. Uh, this is the default ggplot theme, uh, but there are other possibles. So theme, if you type theme underscore, you can see some options. I'm a big fan of classic. because it's, it's very minimal. Uh, things like black and white uh, are very similar, but with a, a, bit, a few more lines, you can, you know, dark. There's a million and there's a, there's another package called GG themes that has a bunch more pre configured themes, including things like default themes for uh, Specific journals, basically. Um, and you can also make your own theme. So like if I wanted to, and I probably should have a default theme for a specific project because I'm always coloring group the media group in this color and the TV group in this color, uh, I could save my own theme and then have it as a function. But like I said, I'm a, I'm a real, I'm a real fan of classic. <laughs> it's my favorite one for sure. So that's kind of as far as this plot really needs to go, but like I said, we can just keep adding uh, to show you what you could do with this. And so let's say I want to color. And again, because I'm going to color by the variable condition, it needs to be inside of aesthetics. And now we're seeing we've colored by condition. But you know what, actually, my preference is that the dots get colored and not the box plots. And so it's important here that anything you put in the original ggplot function gets applied to everything else below it. So like I said, color is condition once it applies to the box plot and the jitter. If I wanted to do some otherwise, what I need to do is put it in one of these. So I only want to color the dots so that I need to put an aesthetic here and get rid of the aesthetic here. And so now my dots are colored, but not my box plot. Or I could color my box plot by a different variable. Another thing you'll see here that's commonly needed, right? This is a this is the you know that pre-made legend, 100% correct. Love it. Uh, but I don't really need it, right? I'm just adding the color because I like the color. And so sometimes you just kind of want to get rid of that legend. Uh, and so inside of theme, I made theme classic, my like base theme. Uh, and then I can just add on a bunch more theme stuff in here, including if I take my legend, oops, legend, so you can change a lot of things about the legend. Theme is probably the longest ggplot help article because there is so much you can do in it. Um, but if I say, again, I tend to like position and say there's no position, none. Now the legend goes away because it wasn't really necessary to begin with. Any questions on a single ggplot or any specific customizations you want to see right now? Error. So it looks like this error in the chat. So it's saying, um, steep, it's basically it doesn't understand the data type. Uh, and so I guess the question is where it seems like you're putting an entire data frame in as an X variable or a Y variable. So it doesn't know how to do it. So if you could paste your code in the chat, that would help.
Ah, the first one. And so I'd say it seems like something went wrong in your the creation of this data frame. So the top, like it should look like this. So it's important thing with, again, with all packages, right? Some errors are beautifully helpful and some are very cryptic and require Googling uh, and some are just experienced. So anytime it says something to do with scaling or continuous or character variable, it's often in terms of ggplot to do with if you, for example, say you told it to plot on a continuous scale, a variable that wasn't continuous, um, which I, we don't really have in this data, uh, it, would, it would yell about that. So as an example about, also I forgot to do the example about when I mean aesthetics, why it has to be in an aesthetic. So right, if I said color equals red here, inside of the aesthetic, um, let's put our legend back so you can see this. We see that what it does, because it's inside of an aesthetic, it's not, okay, it looks kind of red because that's the default. Let's say blue, so it looks really different. Uh, we see that it doesn't color things as blue because this is inside of, of the aesthetic. It's saying, oh, there must be a variable named blue. So I'm gonna map to that variable. Oh, there, it's just one word, so I'm gonna make everything. And so that doesn't work and what you, since that's not a variable, you just have to take it outside of the aesthetic. It's not an aesthetic, so it just, and now it's blue. And that holds for every single layer. So if like, if you wanted to put the color up here and it was blue, it would it also not be an aesthetic, it would be after this parentheses. Well, with that, I'm going to show facets and I'm going to, because there's no point in me typing this out, <laughs> I'm going to copy it directly from the notes and go through what it is. So nobody panic when they see the giant pile of code appear. So don't look at it yet. The first thing about facets is that so our current data frame there's nothing interesting to facet right we could facet by condition and put our box plots in like two different sections but it's unnecessary they're already next to each other right so we're going to go back to the original data and filter it differently so that we have multiple genes to look at and so this there's actually notes in it right this right is the same as we had done before. We took our expression data, we move our row names into a column, we add our symbols. Now here I'm gonna, instead of saying equals interferon gamma, I'm gonna say that the symbol has to be in one of these two gene names, and you can list as many gene names here as you want. And then exactly the same, I'm gonna pivot and add our metadata. And so we're gonna look at what these data but all almost all of that code right is like it's just changing this changing one little part of it and now oh, and of course there's no of course there's an error all oh, right we got rid of rsid because it was unnecessary so now we see that we have 40 rows instead of the 20 we had for interferon gamma. So right, remember gamma, we have 20, 10 media, 10 TV. Here, we have 40 because we have 20 rows for interferon gamma followed by 20 rows, um, which actually let's look at that because don't take my word for it. Let's look at it. So now we see the beauty of the pivot really is that we have our symbol in its own column and then now instead of instead of naming this column interferon gamma because 
that's not what it is. Now it's just expression, because it's expression for both of these genes, because this is a long table. And so instead of saving this, so we're not going to save this as temp, we're not going to save it as anything. Tidyverse pipes means I can do all of this data cleaning, not save it anywhere, and then just immediately pipe it into my ggplot expression. And remember the way a pipe works is it's it's filling in whatever we've piped in like you put it here. It's like you said data equals this data frame, but I never had to save it anywhere because I'm piping it in. So I don't need this. And this is the same thing we did before. Condition, uh, instead of interferon gamma, that's not our variable name anymore, it's just expression. We have our, our geome, we're gonna color by condition, we're gonna beautify our labels. We're not going to do the facet yet because we're just going to show you what this does. But you were all, all of this is the same, just with the pre made notes in it. And so, what you see here is without the facet, because I now have 40 rows, now I have 20 media and 20 TV, and they're not separated by the gene. In fact, it's easier to see that. Let's do this color by the HGZ symbol. And let's keep our legend. You can see here that they're mixed together of the two. And so that's not that's not what we want, right? But that's the first step before faceting. It's always a good idea to get your faceted plot like overlapped version like this, how you want it. And then you simply add one thing and this is facet wrap and you tell it what variable you want to separate everything by. And it does that and it labels each. And I assume everyone in their home is cheering because it's really exciting. Uh, I just made two plots with very, very little effort. And in terms of, you know, gene expression data, sometimes you need to make 30 plots and this does it. And nicely, in this case, they're on the same scale. So they're forcing the X uh, and Y axes to be the same. Uh, that's nice here, so you can directly compare. But they don't have to. We could say free, give a free scale for the Y, which means it's going to allow that this left plot and this right plot have two different Y axis scales, and it makes it fill up the entire space for both. So I can't you know, here I can directly look and say like, oh, it looks like interferon alpha tends to be lower than interferon gamma. And I can just see that visually really quick. Uh, here you can't see that as much unless you, you know, you can notice the scale that this is zero and this is six, very different, um, particularly on a log scale. But it is much easier to see, you know, this looks like it's up in TB. You can see that a bit, but you can see it even more here. So that's all of the content. Uh, at this point, uh, we can either go have, break up and go through the exercises, or I'm very happy at this moment to, if there are any specific plotting things you know you're gonna need to know how to do, I'm happy to show them now, because I work in ggplot a lot, and I might off the top of my head know the right thing. So either verbalize or pop in the chat if there's any known plot things, and I'll give it like two minutes, and if not, We'll work on the exercises. <laughs> 